Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Ron White! Thanks, man. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start off this evening by asking you a question, because I don't know the answer. Uh, I lost my sunglasses, and uh, yesterday I went to the sunglass hut. Here's the question. Why does a pair of sunglasses cost more than a 25-inch color television set? I go to the sunglass hut, I see a pair of glasses I like. I don't love them. I don't. I like them. 309 bucks. And I asked the guy very politely, how do you sleep at night, you little prick? You know what I mean? I was just wondering. And I told him, and this is true, that two weeks ago I bought a 25-inch color television set from Walmart for 218 bucks. And he goes, well, apparently, sir, you don't get it. I'm listening. He goes, these glasses eliminate 100% of all UV rays. I'm like, no, apparently you don't get it. This thing decodes a digital satellite signal that picks up from outer fucking space. And then it turned out the glasses got basic cable and I felt like a dickhead. <laughs> Look, Braveheart, fight! <laughs> you ever take a crap so big your pants fit better? <laughs> Anybody ever do that? Have you ever? I'm hoping that happens to me later tonight because uh, these babies don't fit anymore. I'm hoping I'm one big turd away from backing into an old wardrobe. Yesterday, I was sitting in a beanbag chair, naked, eating Cheetos, and then... I was flipping through the television, and I saw Robert Tilton. He's a televangelist from Dallas, and uh, he was staring at me. And he said this. He said... Are you lonely? <laughs> yeah. He said, have you wasted half your life in bars pursuing sins of the flesh? <laughs> this guy's good. 
He said, are you sitting in a beanbag chair naked eating Cheetos? <laughs> yes, sir. He said, do you feel the urge to get up and send me a thousand dollars? Close. <laughs> I thought he was talking about me there for a second. Apparently, I ain't the only cat on the block digs Cheeto. <laughs> so it's great to be uh, back in Kalamazoo at the uh, State Theater. <laughs> Last time I was here, they took me to the blues festival, which, and I love the blues, but the, uh, they had to figure out some problems with the festival. I don't, <laughs> I don't like to party anywhere where you can't just give somebody money and they give you back a beer. You know what I mean? I stood in line for an hour. My mouth is dry. I want a beer. I love beer. I know they're selling beer. People are walking away from the front of the line. They've got beer. That's how I figured the whole thing out. I get up there, I give the guy my money, he goes, we don't take money here. <laughs> what do you take? <laughs> Coupons. <laughs> what? <laughs> Coupons. <laughs> Where do I get a coupon? <laughs> See that line over there? <laughs> it takes forever. I stood in that line for an hour. I got to show them a driver's license, birth certificate, fill out a form. They mail that away. <laughs> Send me back some coupons. What are you doing, Ron? I'm waiting on UPS. There's a, there's a good chance I'll have a beer by Thursday. I'm partying like a Kennedy right now. I was a game, too. I had 100 bucks cash on me. I bought 100 bucks worth of coupons. And then some guys that took me there asked me if I wanted to go to a uh, topless club, and I didn't uh, want to go. I just ended up going because you guys backed me up on this. You've seen one woman naked. You want to see the rest of them naked. <laughs> It could be an old biker chick. You know, they're going to hang down to here. Say, you want to see my titties? Yeah, I do. All right, that's enough. Roll them back up. <laughs> Things that make you go. <laughs> and then closing time came around and the tabs came out and I found out the titty bar don't accept them coupons. The guy at Taco Bell told me to kiss his ass. <laughs> I'll give you $40 worth of coupons for a burrito with cheese. <laughs> it's all I've got. <laughs> it's a coupon. So I saw something that comes close to truth in advertising. The De Beers people are almost saying what they really mean because the old De Beers slogan was, Diamonds are forever. Then they changed it to this year, Take her breath away. The new slogan is, Diamonds render her speechless. Why don't they just go ahead and say it? Diamonds. That'll shut her up. <laughs> 
for a minute. So, man, I was just in uh, uh, Miami. God, I don't know, it was a couple years ago, so I didn't guess just would not be the word, but uh, I was working there with Fox when Hurricane George hit the Keys. I just thought this was kind of funny. They evacuated the Keys. And everybody left except for, I've been through two hurricanes. I was uh, in Hurricane Carla when I was a kid in Houston. And I was real excited during hurricane time, you know, because it's out there in the Gulf and it's dangerous. And I was like, this is cool. So shit started hitting our house. I was like, fuck this. <laughs> but anyway, they evacuate the keys and everybody leaves except for one guy who's going to stay there and tie himself to a tree on the beach to prove a point, and the point was, he said that at 53 years of age, he was in good enough physical condition to withstand the wind and the rain from a forced tree hurricane. All right. <laughs> Let me explain something to you. It isn't that the wind is blowing, it's what the wind is blowing. <laughs> If you get hit with a Volvo, <laughs> it doesn't really matter how many sit-ups you did that morning. That's right. But if you have a yield sign in your spleen, jogging don't come into play. I can run 25 miles without stopping. You're bleeding. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> so, man, last time I was here, I had uh, somebody broke into my truck and stole my radio. Thank you, whoever you were. I uh, <laughs> got to drive back to Texas, listen to the sound of wind for 49 hours. I went to the insurance company, I was filling out these forms, and I got to the part on the form where it says, what kind of radio was it? And I told the guy, I didn't remember, and he said, Mr. White, if you can remember what kind of radio it was, we'll know how much money to give you. That's some good news right there. I thought of a real expensive sounding brand, and I wrote it down, and he knew I was lying. He, Mr. White, I don't believe Rolex makes a radio. It was a clock radio. <laughs> Write the check, premium boy. They love it when you call them premium boy. Next time you see your agent, call him premium boy. You'll get a chuckle. Huh. <sighs> I uh, almost, uh, almost died this year. Uh, actually, I didn't almost die. I didn't even get hurt. Uh, I was uh, in a near-miss plane uh, crash. We um, were making a movie, and uh, I was flying from uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, to Phoenix, Arizona, because my manager doesn't own a globe. We're on a plane that big. It's like a pack of gum with eight people in it. And what happened was we took off from the Flagstaff Airport Hair Care and Tire Center there. We're traveling at half the speed of smell. We got passed by a kite. <laughs> there was a goose behind us, and the pilot was screaming, Go around! <laughs> we get halfway to Phoenix, we got to go back. It's a nine-minute flight. 
can't pull it off with this equipment. <laughs> we had engine trouble. We lost some oil pressure in one of the engines, and they told us about it over the speaker system of the plane, which was stupid because they could have just went, hey, we lost some oil pressure. <laughs> Heard you. <laughs> sure did. It was weird. Everybody on the plane was nervous, but I'd been drinking since lunch. I was like, take it down. I don't give a shit. <laughs> you ever have one of those, James? <laughs> Hit something hard. I don't want to limp away from this piece of shit. The guy sitting next to me is losing his mind. Apparently, he had a lot to live for. <laughs> he goes, hey, man, uh, uh, hey, man, uh, uh, if one of these engines fails, uh, uh, how far will the other one take us? <laughs> All the way to the scene of the crash. Which is pretty handy, because that's where we're headed. <laughs> I bet we beat the paramedics there by a half hour. <laughs> we're hauling ass. <laughs> so, I've got a really good job. I like my job. I, uh, it's important to have a good vocabulary, you know. Uh, actually, I, I haven't always had a good vocabulary. Uh, when I was young, if I'd known the difference between antidote and anecdote, my friend Bob Schneider would still be alive today. <laughs> he got bit by a copperhead. I'm reading him humorous stories out of Reader's Digest. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I am uh, from uh, Texas. I'm a cowboy, a real cowboy. I was, uh, I was a bronc rider for six years of my life, and it's affected me. Now when I have sex, my arm goes like this. Seems to be some dispute between the wife and I whether or not I'm staying on that full eight seconds. So. so we uh, got the timer and buzzer and set it up right there in the bedroom. And I taught her the meaning of the phrase most of the time. Would have been all the time, but she won't let me tie that rope around her waist anymore. She hates it when I spur her out of the chutes. Hey, you laugh. It's not easy to keep an erection with a clown in a barrel in the corner of the room. <laughs> Is it, sir? <laughs> you gotta focus. I'm probably not a typical Texan in that I don't hunt. I fish, but I don't hunt. And not because I think it might somehow be more holy to eat meat that's been bludgeoned to death by somebody else. That's not it. It's really early in the morning. It's really cold outside. And I don't want to go. My cousin Ray, on the other hand, thinks killing a deer with a deer rifle is magic in the forest. I'd like to do for you now my impression of my cousin Ray after the big kill. Well, it was four in the morning. 22 degrees outside. Of course, you weren't there. Pussy. I 
I'm in a camouflage deer blind with grease paint on my face. I've got deer urine on my boots. I'm not sure why. I made that part up. I got a 30 out six with a 12 power scope and a bullet that'll travel 2,200 feet per second. When that deer looked up to lick the salt sucker I'd hung from the danged old tree. <laughs> caught him right above the eye. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I hit one with a van. <laughs> Going 55 miles an hour with the headlights on and the horn blowing. Woo, that's an elusive little creature. <laughs> if you ever miss one, it's because the bullet's moving too fast. Throw the bullet down to 55 miles an hour, put some headlights and a little horn on it. The deer will actually jump in front of the bullet. Happily married man. Um, thank you very much for asking. I uh, married a rich woman, if you ever have a choice. Go ahead. Actually, that's, uh, that's um, the lie. She's not rich at all. Her parents are loaded. <laughs> And they hate my guts. <laughs> and I'm waiting for them to die. <laughs> and you'll know if they die too, because you'll never see my fat ass again. I'll be in Palm Beach with my new friends. <laughs> Hand me a beer, Teddy. <laughs> servants rich. My in-laws have servants. Is that weird? I thought when I married their daughter, they'd send a servant along with us to help do all the shit they never taught her how to do. <laughs> And I was wrong. <laughs> We're now leaning on her domestic skills and whoo, she's handy. <laughs> I came up from doing a show the other night. She goes, honey, the dryer's broken. I'm like, did you check the lint filter, sweetheart? <laughs> Sit down, honey, I'll check it. I open it up. Is there anything in there? There's a quilt in there. <laughs> Look, you made a sofa cushion. <laughs> I hear a lot of this. I hear a lot of, Ron, oh, Ron, you're a pretty good sized old boy. Well, I guess a little woman's a good cook. Bullshit. <laughs> oh, it got a little better when she figured out that smoke alarm's not a timer. <laughs> I had to... I had to tell her, honey, the food is done before that particular buzzer goes off. <laughs> it was real bad when we first got married. The first meal she cooked in our new house, I couldn't eat it. I gave it to my dog. He started licking his butt. <laughs> she comes in the kitchen and goes, what's he doing? <laughs> Looks like he's trying to get the taste out of his mouth.
And everything's an emergency to my wife because she never had to deal with her own problems. Spoil, cater to her, her whole life. There's no cure, right, for that. I was in Atlanta one time. She calls me one night, misses me in the hotel room. They catch me in the lobby and tell me I have an emergency phone call from home. I knock over 10 people in the lobby of a very nice hotel thinking maybe my in-laws. <laughs> I call her, she tells me my dog Sluggo just took a dump on the new carpet. Shoot him. She goes, that's just like you, Ron. I have a genuine problem, and you're being sarcastic. <laughs> All right, honey, I'm sorry. Put the dog on the phone, I'll talk to him. <laughs> I can't pick up the turd. <laughs> Put a paper towel over it. I'll be home in a week, honey. <laughs> I get home, it looks like a little campground in the living room. <laughs> Somebody's having a Poopa Palooza concert. Let him outside. He'll shit out there. I've seen him do it. We have a beautiful son. His name is Marshall. I named him after an amplifier. Uh, almost named him Peavy. Come here, blob punk, you little woofer. Get over here. My son's five years old. My son thinks five years old is a very cool age to be because that's the coolest age he's gotten to. His uh, favorite thing about being five years old is he's old enough to wear a seatbelt. That's his biggest visible step towards manhood so far in his eyes, you know. He's strapped in the truck just like his daddy, and he thinks that's great. I think it's great, too, because I drive a four-wheel drive truck, and I learned this about four-wheel drive trucks. It doesn't really matter how big the motor is or how big the tires are. Your macho days are over when you strap a car seat in front of that bad boy. <laughs> you just can't show it off to your buddies, you know what I mean? You, just, you can't make yourself go, what, Pat? That's got the Vortec V8 running 285 horsepower. Yeah! That, that's a man-at-to-walk power winch. That'll pull 28 tons right out of the ditch. Yeah. That, that's a play school car seat <laughs> with the big bird steering wheel attachment right there on it. That's Bird on the blinker, Ernie on the windshield wiper. That's Big Bird in the middle. You can honk that fat bastard if you want to. <laughs> well, in two weeks, I'll have the Cookie Monster flip mirror. <laughs> Back ordered it on me. I don't know how I drive the truck anymore. I bought this big uh, two-story custom van to tour in. And it's kind of neat. It's got the James Bond couch in the back where you push a button, and the couch in the back automatically turns into a uh, bed. And I'm like, well, that's cool. I finally got something over those Mercedes-Benz driving in-laws of mine. You know what I mean? When I first bought the van, I was real proud of it, and I took it straight over to my brother-in-law's house to show it off because he's such a prick. <laughs> he takes one look at my new van and goes, I can't believe you didn't buy a Mercedes-Benz. <laughs> they don't make a van.
They hate it when you do that. He goes, Rod, I don't think you fully understand the intricacies of Mercedes-Benz engineering. <laughs> Why, I've got the three-inch windshield wiper that keeps my headlight clean in a rainstorm. <laughs> I got a place to fuck your sister. I don't know why they don't like me. <laughs> Bet you wish you had one of these. <laughs> Whiskey. <coughs> Tasty. Actually, no, that was all bullshit. I just got a divorce. I just wanted to do those three jokes before I told you. Um, and I'll tell you what went wrong, And because I, I feel like I can be honest with you folks and you won't judge me, or maybe you will. I don't care. Uh, but I'll tell you, it's very, very difficult to marry out of your class. I come from a lower middle class family. My daddy worked his ass off his whole life for not very much. And that does not make you better than me. You know what I mean? Uh, my dad was a good man. And, uh, that's right. And they're always going to just look down their nose at you like you're supposed to be carrying some piss bucket for them or something. And if you're not willing to carry the piss bucket, it ain't going to work. And, and she got convinced in her crazy head that I had sex with this girl in Columbus, Ohio. And I did, and I'll tell you why. When you enter into a monogamous relationship with somebody, you usually do it at a point in the relationship when you're having a lot of sex. So you're willing to sign the papers. I'll only have sex with you ever, 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 ever. Well, if that person stops having sex altogether, why, you find yourself in quite a pickle. I'm a pretty good dog, but if you don't pet me every once in a while, it's hard to keep me under the porch. <laughs> I'm not as flexible as a real dog. <laughs> but I'll tell you what happened, too. I was in Columbus, Ohio. I hadn't been laid in three months. Three months. You can't go three months without having sex with me. I'll go have sex with somebody else. I know. I've seen me do it. I did a show one night, I came off stage, there's a gorgeous woman, maybe 35, 40 years old, long black dress, slid up to her waist, gorgeous. Give me a second. Gorgeous. And I walk off stage, she goes, I thought you were hilarious, I want to buy you a drink. I'm like, I can't do that, I'm married. She goes, I didn't ask me if you want to have sex, big boy, I asked if you want to have a drink at my place. I'm like, all right. Well, you know that little guy that sits on your shoulder that reminds you of your prior commitments and your moral fortitude? I didn't hear a peep out of that guy. <laughs> he hadn't been laid in three months either. <laughs> he was speechless for like 20 minutes, and he was like, Sucker Kitty! I was gonna. <laughs> I'm having a three-way with my conscience. As soon as the whole thing's over, he's back at his post. That was wrong, mister! Like, hey, 20 minutes ago, you were beating off on my shoulder, monkey boy. 
I hate him. He smokes pot. He burned a hole in my other jacket. I've been spending a ton of time in Los Angeles. I learn things when I go to L.A. I learned this. They have bikinis now made out of seashells. I didn't know that. And I also didn't know this. If you're ever walking down the beach and you see a girl dressed in a bikini made out of seashells and you pick her up and hold her to your ear, <laughs> you can hear her scream. <laughs> Who'd have thunk it, I I thought I'd hear the ocean, but not over that woman. <laughs> Hush, ma'am. She was a wiggler. <laughs> L.A. changes people. I got a buddy of mine from uh, Houston. He's a comedian. Moved to L.A. six months ago. Six months in L.A. Don't know him. Six months in L.A. Now he's a vegetarian, a humanitarian, environmentalist. You know, great. If you're here tonight and you're a vegetarian, shut up. <laughs> you're not going to recruit me. I did not climb to the top of the food chain to eat carrots. <laughs> it's not even that good for you. You ever see a healthy looking vegetarian? They look like shit, don't they? They're all plump and gray because their bodies become intolerant of things they need. And I'll give you an example. I'm on the way to the Melrose Improv in Hollywood to do a set with my buddy, and he says this, and I quote, I feel nauseous and I have a headache. I think that vegetable soup I had for lunch must have had beef broth in it. <laughs> I didn't know what to say. <laughs> Your system's kicking back Broth? <laughs> You're a manly man, aren't you? <laughs> Why are you a vegetarian? I asked him, and it wasn't even because meat was bad for you. He said that raising cattle was bad for the planet with cow flatulence in the ozone and the clearing of land for the raising of cattle. What are you doing to help the environment? I'm eating the cows. But I'm only one man. Whatever the hell that meant. <laughs> Every time I read a newspaper in Los Angeles, California, I get pissed because uh, things don't have to make sense in L.A. I read an article in the paper in L.A. that said they're going to try to outlaw the big screen, real life handgun shooting video games because they say that that's what's wrong with the youth of America today. They're learning how to accurately shoot guns. Uh, with video games. It's not a parenting problem. Oh, fucking no. <laughs> no, it's a video problem. Doesn't that piss you off when you have a genuine problem you try to tack a solution to? It's got nothing to do with the problem. You know what I mean? I came up with a great idea. Don't outlaw those machines. Give them to the state troopers of California because they're some of the worst shots I've ever seen in my life. I saw a shootout once live on TV that went on for so long, eventually the criminal got frustrated and shot himself. <laughs> and the cops are on TV whining about it, going, he's got on body armor, he's got on body armor. I'm watching it live on CNN going, I can see his head, shoot him in the fucking head. <laughs> Give my kid a shot. How's that, Daddy? Good shot, Poot. Everybody relax. Poot took him out. Thank God Poot was there with his considerable skills. Horrible shot. Some cops are. You ever see tape of the Kehoe brothers from Ohio? Those guys that get out of that white suburban, they show it on cops. You see it? These guys, folks, have a shootout with the police at point blank 
rains, nobody gets hurt. <laughs> I would love to have been at the office the next day when that guy's being interviewed by the chief. And then what happened? Well, at that point, I unloaded my semi-automatic 9mm weapon at point blank range. And then what happened? They left. <laughs> nice shooting, Elmer Fudd. <laughs> there was a kid in Detroit three years ago shot eight bullets, hit nine people. <laughs> These two cops shot 22 bullets, didn't even hit the fucking Suburban. <laughs> Give those guys a roll of quarters and drop them off at the mall. That's all I'm saying. You know what I mean? It's just not like Texas, you know. i tell you the biggest difference between Texas and California. In Texas, we have the death penalty and we use it. That's right. If you come to Texas and kill somebody, we will kill you back. That's our policy. We're trying to send a message to the rest of America, and the message is go somewhere else and kill people. Go to California. They don't give a shit. I was watching a case on court TV when I was out there. I got so mad, steam was shooting out of my ears. This guy's convicted of a triple homicide. This guy kills a grandmother, a mother, and a granddaughter without provocation. He, and a crime so heinous, I can't even fit it in my head. He's sentenced to death by a jury of his peers, and right before it comes time to carry out the sentence, a group of people on his behalf, on his behalf, stand up and they go, we can't kill him. He's too crazy to know we're killing him. <laughs> then what the hell are we arguing about? <laughs> if he don't know the difference and it makes me feel better. You know he's crazy. That's what I want to know. Of course he's crazy. He killed three people, you know? Uh, yeah, this is what they said. He, he rolls his turds into little balls and eats crayons. I'm like, shit, you gotta quit putting all crazy people in one group, goddammit. You gotta separate them up a little bit. You know what I mean? What does that crazy person do? Oh, he rolls his turds into little balls and eats crayons. Fine, I'll feed him for the rest of his life. What does that crazy person do? Oh, he kills productive members of our society. Well, he should have rolled his shit into little balls and ate crayons. Because the penalty is much less severe. trying to pass a bill right now through the Texas legislature that'll speed up the process of execution in heinous crimes where there's more than three credible eyewitnesses. If more than three people saw you do what you did, you don't sit on death row for 15 years, Jack. You go straight to the front of the line. Other states are... <laughs> Other states are trying to abolish the death penalty my state's putting in an express lane. <laughs> I did that bit out in California, and this guy comes up to me after the show, and you could tell he was nervous to talk to me, and he goes, uh, he goes, you know what, that may be true about Texas and the death penalty, but you know what, you know what? What? He waited for me to say what? That's kind of cute. He goes, there's an old law in Texas that states that in Texas you cannot shoot somebody in the back no matter what they did to you or your family or your place of business. It's illegal for you to, in turn, shoot them 
in the back. I'm like, yeah, but you can start shooting them in the leg till they turn around. <laughs> Because eventually, they're going to get curious. <laughs> Who's shooting me in the leg, I wonder quietly to myself. <laughs> oh, that guy. <laughs> Never turn around. I was talking to a buddy of mine the other day. My friend, I have a friend, that's a, he's a real, he's a homophobe. Isn't that the most useless thing you could possibly be, is afraid of gay people? And I was talking to him the other day, and he goes, he goes, man, this world would be better if it weren't so many queers. And I'm like, you know what, the next time you have a thought, let it go. <laughs> I go, we're all gay. It's just to what extent are you gay? He goes, that's bullshit, man. I ain't gay at all. I'm like, yeah, you are, and I can prove it. He goes, fine, prove it. I'm like, all right, do you like porn? He goes, yeah, I love porn, you know that. I'm like, oh, do you only watch scenes with two women together? He goes, no, I watch a man and a woman making love. I'm like, oh, do you like the guy to have a small, half flaccid penis? He goes, no, I like big, hard, throbbing cock. I did not know that about myself. <laughs> I promised Sears I would tell this story on stage every night until the lawsuit settled. <laughs> I had my van down in Savannah, Georgia. I didn't like the way the tires were wearing on it. I took the van to Sears Automotive trusted name and automotive service. <laughs> Takes them three and a half hours to change four tires. Apparently they had to whittle one of them out of a piece of wheat. <laughs> I pay them $980 of my hard earned money. I take a right hand turn out of the mall. The left rear wheel falls off. It falls off. It falls the fuck off. <laughs> Turning my van into a tripod, <laughs> spinning me into a dimension of pissed off I have never been in before in my life. This guy was a tired guy. That's all he did. He didn't some days work on transmissions. He was a tired guy. Sears, I found out later, had sent him to tire college <laughs> for three days. Well, apparently he was sick on lug nut day. <laughs> but they still let him work on my van. So I'm suing them, and I hope that next year they have to change the name of Sears Tower in Chicago to Ron White's uh, big old goddamn building. <laughs> you guys can all come over and party, too. I'm going to have a lot of room. <laughs> Think we ought to clean up, Ron? Hell no, move to another floor. <laughs> we'll conga up there. Somebody grab my butt. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Uh, bring your coupons.
I got thrown out of a bar in New York City. Now, when I say I got thrown out of a bar, I don't mean somebody asked me to leave. We walked to the door together, and I said, bye, everybody, I got to go. Six bouncers hurled me out of a nightclub like I was a Frisbee. Those big old bouncers that go home every night watch Roadhouse and beat off. You know what I'm talking about? The Patrick Sweezy's hitting another guy. <laughs> For wearing a hat. I walk into a bar with a hat on. This guy, real pissy, he goes, Took off the hat! <laughs> I'm like, What's the deal? He goes, I'll tell you what the deal is. Faggots in this area wear hats. We're trying to keep them out of a club. I'm like, Oh, really? The only way we can tell down south is if they have their hair cut like your. <laughs> And he got all pissed. <laughs> but he walked away and I took the hat off and like an hour later I'd been drinking and I forgot. You ever forget? It happened to me. <laughs> I put the hat back on, the guy comes over to me. Now, I'm between 6'1 and 6'6, depending on which convenience store I'm leaving. I weigh 235 pounds. This guy comes over to me, poking me in the shoulder with two fingers, says, you're out of here. I'm like, I don't think so, Scooter. <laughs> and I was wrong. <laughs> they hurled my ass. And then they squared off with me in the parking lot, and I backed down from the fight, because I don't know how many of them it would have taken to whip my ass. But I knew how many they were going to use. It's a handy little piece of information to have right there. Overkill. Well, they called the police because we broke a chair on the way out the door and I refused to pay for it. And the cops showed up and at that point, I had the right to remain silent, but I didn't have the ability. The cop says, Mr. White, you are being charged with drunk in public. I was like, hi, 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 hi. I was drunk in a bar. They threw me into public. I don't want to be drunk in public. I want to be drunk in a goddamn bar, which is perfectly legal. Arrest them. Well, he didn't arrest them. Instead, they call in for my arrest record. And there's some good news. <laughs> Satellites are linking up in outer space. Computer banks at NASA are kicking on. There's a telegraph in Fritch, Texas going, this part takes a while. Shorthand. Beep. Now, I told you that story to tell you this story. When I was 17 years old, I was arrested for being drunk in public. <laughs> Seemed to be a pattern. <laughs> if you knew Morse code, you would already know that. <laughs> and one DWI, which was a bogus charge, because it turns out they were stopping every vehicle traveling down that particular sidewalk And that's profiling, <laughs> I believe. And the drunken public charge 
in French, the arresting officer, who I had literally known all my life. You know what I mean? This guy lived four doors down from me in a town of less than 400 people. We've met. <laughs> he takes me to jail. When we get there, he asks me if I have any aliases, and I was just being a smart ass and said, yeah. They call me Tater Sally. <laughs> 17 years later in New York City, I'm handcuffed on a bench with blood coming out of my nose. And this cop goes, are you Ron Tater Salad White? <laughs> you caught me. You caught the tater. You can take down those roadblocks now. I call my son Tater Tot. And Poot. So anyway. I am a dog lover. Actually, I love my dog. I don't give a shit about your dog. Uh, I don't know your dog, man. Your dog could be an asshole. I don't know. <laughs> Sluggo's an English bulldog. Sluggo, don't jack with me. Her, 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 her. <laughs> Great. You know what I do to him when he's asleep? I lift up those big old huge bulldog jowls, and I hide him and ms and shit in there. <laughs> he wakes up in the morning, he's like... <laughs> going to be a good day, Tater. <laughs> he calls me Tater. <laughs> He's a great dog. He's sick right now, which is a pain in the butt, because if he gets sick, you can't just feed him medicine. He'll spit it out. you got to hide it in a piece of cheese. I started him out last year for picking the litter, and I put him with the female dog for a couple of weeks, and then to make sure it took, I took him down to the veterinarian's office and had artificial insemination done twice. Now, for those of you that don't know, that's where they obtained the semen from Sluggo and put it in the female dog, and now it don't take shit to get old Sluggo to go to the vet. <laughs> he loves the place. <laughs> I went down there, the veterinarian had the audacity to say to me, Mr. White, if you'll just come on back here, we'll show you how to do this, and next time you don't have to bring in the dog, you can just bring in the semen. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> you go ahead and jack off the dog. <laughs> he follows me around too much as it is. <laughs> Like, I'm going to spend the rest of my life with this bulldog. Jack me off! Get out of here. We got company. You did it the other day. Do it yourself. I don't have any thoughts. I don't have any goddamn thoughts. Now, jack me off, you piece of shit. Do we talk to daddy that way? <laughs> Please? Please jack me off, you piece of shit. I don't have any goddamn dog. <laughs> I've lost my mind, haven't I? I'll tell you a little bit more about the demise of my relationship. Um, there was that one thing where I had uh, sex with that girl, but uh, that wasn't the underlying problem. The big problem was, uh, the first problem was this. We lived in a house, and it had a thermostat. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Because I like the temperature of the house between 70 and 75, and she liked the temperature of the house between 75 and 110. 
and you can't keep tater salad at that temperature. We fought about it. She was psycho. Psycho women love me. We have an argument one night about the temperature of a dwelling. She goes outside with a butcher knife and cuts the tires on my truck. So I drug up an old Polaroid and entered her in Hustler's Beaver Hunt. <laughs> and she won. <laughs> And I used the money to get me some new tires. <laughs> and she super glued my dick to my stomach, so. <laughs> Do you see how things just get out of hand? <laughs> Still itches. <laughs> what? After three years of being married to this woman, I still didn't understand her. She, she would get mad at me when I was trying to help her. I'll give you an example. Let's say she'd wake up in the morning and be real bitchy. Let's just say. <laughs> and I knew in my heart she was suffering from PMS. And out of my love, <laughs> I would offer her my doll and tell her, honey, I believe if you eat this my doll, you won't bitch quite so much. <laughs> she would growl at me and wouldn't eat the my doll. I had to hide it in a piece of cheese. <laughs> Thanks for playing along. I hope you enjoyed it. You guys were great, man. Thank you very much. Pocket, so I don't have to go too far. It's a beautiful song, isn't it? <laughs> so, how'd you like the show? It was awesome. It was very funny. Awesome. Oh, I loved it. I think it's hilarious. Ron White kills me. Yeah, I, that tater salad joke gets me, man. I couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> tater salad. We awful. love it. <laughs> we love it. He's too funny. My jaws hurt, and I think I was crying more than anything. <laughs> You enjoy the show? Yes. You had a really good time? Yes. Did you laugh? Hilarious. Yes, I did. Did you, uh, um, did you pee? No. He's not only funny, he is a cutie pie. And a nice butt. <laughs> My side still hurts. It's so funny. Uh, the bit about his in-laws, it's just hilarious. It's hilarious. Guy from Texas, they sh that's, uh... That's like a sitcom waiting to happen. I think I'm going to start drinking scotch. <laughs> Where'd you see the blue collar tour? Um, at a house. At a house. <laughs> <laughs> drinking beer, eating popcorn, you know. Tanner cake.